Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Zhang Lihui, the executive president of Caixin, the leading finance and business media group in China. Our topic today is important to everybody, the future of work. Yes, technological change has been reshaping people, human life and work for centuries. You may know the numbers before. A consulting firm McKinsey predicted that by 2030, roughly 15% of current activities may be automated, and 14% of global forces may need to switch occupational categories due to digitization and advance in AI. So 2030, there's only 10 years to go. What kind of workforce is needed for the 21st century? Will the technology liberate and redeploy people towards more creative roles? What about the human identity associated with work? We have 10 years to figure it out, but the, the discussion shouldn't wait. I'm glad we have a very super panel today, and together we'll explore how the future of work could bring about the societal changes. Let's start from the lady on my far left, Aruna. Aruna Jianchi, the managing director of APEC and Latin America of Capgemini. Aruna, as a leading figure in the IT services industry in India, can you pro provide us with a big picture on how the technology is, evol is evolving and reshaping businesses in different regions in the world? Uh, thanks, Lui. So um, technology definitely has a big impact uh, on businesses. It's, there's a lot that you can see that touches us directly in our um, everyday life. Um, so a lot of exciting and innovative stuff that is happening. But if I have to take a very simplistic view on the impact, I'd look at it from three perspectives. Okay? Number one is the technology that is driving efficiency and productivity improvements in organizations. Okay, So you look at uh, automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, chatbots. All of these are truly driving, like she already said, high levels of automation and productivity. So for example, you take uh, jobs such as accounting. The lower end of the accounting function is predicted that 80% of it will be uh, can be automated. And, and so what happens to those um, uh, to those skills and those jobs in the future. You look at uh, contact center jobs, okay? So with chatbots, self-service, self-help, uh, a lot of that, more than half of that is not required. So you take each aspect of business, and I think there's a big impact of technology that is driving productivity and therefore impacts the future of work and how businesses address that within the organizations. That's one. The second element of technology view is around data, data and analytics. And I think today companies, um, even governments, have so much data and are truly using it to analyze it and to draw insights into it, insights into how can they serve their customers better, why is somebody buying ice cream during a rainy day, or why is somebody buying cosmetics in uh, you know one part of the country more than something else. So th there is a lot of insight and personalization that's being driven by data and um, analytics. And, uh, and it's not just in business, even in governments. I mean, come on, election, you, you've heard of some of the election results being uh, I wouldn't say manipulated, but um, uh, coached in a certain direction thanks to the insights that you have on, on uh, water behavior. So that's the second one around how data and the analysis of data is influencing our decision making in organizations. And the third one is all about IoT and the machine to machine communication technologies like quantum computing and so on, IoT, which are really influencing how we are getting into more smart cities and smart environments. I think combined, uh, as I said, it's a simplistic view. There's a lot more out there. But at a, at a, this is really forcing organizations to rethink the way they do business, rethink the way that they manage their stakeholders, and, and is driving what today uh, most of us call as digital transformation. So there is no doubt a big impact. 
Um, does it vary from region to region? Yes. If you look at China, very advanced in the use of uh, artificial intelligence. You look at some other countries, they are behind. But what is for sure is that technology is forcing businesses to rethink the way that they operate. Thank you, Aruna. Uh, the second speaker is Connie, uh, Connie Hung, the partner and the head of Capital Markets Asia Pacific at Clifford Chance. Tony, uh, you're from one of the largest international law firm. But law firm have, relatively, relatively speaking, a more traditional structure and uh, uh, career path. How do you see the future of workplace? Thank you, Li Hui. Um, let me start by saying I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I'm uh, originally from Singapore. I'm still Singaporean, grew up here, moved to Hong Kong in uh, 1997. Um, so I'm the only lawyer on the panel uh, amongst um, these esteemed speakers uh, from the tech sector and consulting sector. So when I first started uh, my legal career as a trainee, um, it was very much a master-disciple relationship, um, including photocopying, you carried the bags of your supervisor and your uh, pupil master. Uh, it was very much that kind of learning style very focused on technology, uh, technical, picking up of technical skills. Now, I think we can probably push all that out of the door. We don't, we don't see that now. We, we definitely can't get somebody to carry our bags for us. That's not right. Um, but there are many, many changes to come. But let me just zone in on maybe uh, three key changes. Um, the the big, the big elephant in the room, and Arun has already spoken about it, uh, is technology. Now, technology is here to stay. Uh, and the only technology I recall using when I was a trainee 20-something years ago was the telephone. Not even the mobile phone, but the telephone. Everything else was paper and pen, pencil. Um, but technology is here to stay, and technology has to form part of our offering. So. For example, uh, in delivering legal services, we're using some tech solutions combined with um, um, human judgment. Uh, we're also using some AI to carry out, say, for example, due diligence. And some of the grunt work that Aruna alluded to, I mean, that's now being automized. And we also um, are looking into um, applied solutions. So coming up with, you know, we have lawyers who are also coders and they come up with uh, software solutions for clients in a tailored fashion, like drafting documents, um, for example, or compliance tools. Um, so, which is, brings me into the second point of looking forward. How do we train our people? Like, training is very important. So we have AI and technology on the one hand, but at the end of the day, um, the legal services, law firms, Apart from delivering the technical you know, knowledge or uh, technical um, advice on what the law says, it's actually a trust business. We, you know, clients are looking for a trusted advisor to deliver that, that advice to them. So it can't just be technology, it's got to be the human touch. Um, I don't think clients want to go to a robot, at least now at this age, to, to get advice. I think they still need the delivery of the advice, the human judgment to come from somebody. Um, so I guess that's where we come in. But we need to prepare the workforce for the future, building critical thinking skills, innovation, actually fostering creativity. Um, and I think that's one of our biggest challenges. Um, last year, we started this project called Project Ignite, which is really to relook at how we train our uh, younger lawyers. Um, in law firms, we have a two-year um, training, training program. Um, and we have looked at integrating technology into this training program, where trainees can spend 20% of their time focused on just thinking about solutions, ideas, um, which is, you know, for a dinosaur like a law firm, that's, uh, I think, pretty, pretty um, a big step forward. Now, last but not least, I think the third change um, that will come um, is actually what I call values of a firm, and that's really important. Um, looking at you know, the new talent that we hire, it's, it's no longer about what can you do for the firm, but what can we do together? And the younger generation of talent, who will be our leaders of the future, 
they want to work for an organization that where they actually align in their values, be it you know um, climate or uh, you know diversity uh, and inclusion. So just on the topic of um, inclusion and diversity, because we're at um, the Women's Forum, I mean, these are issues that um, you know, our firm takes very seriously, and certainly in the legal industry, that has gained great prominence. Um, so for example, um, we're really proud to say that you know, at Clifford Chance, the head of our partnership selection committee is a, is a lady, is a female partner. Um, and I was on the PS Partnership Selection Committee some years back as a rotational basis. And at one point, we had more women than men um, on the committee. Um, and, and that's a sex person committee, so actually, you know, the voices are pretty loud. So I think these are the things that will shape um, the future of the workplace technology, reskilling, training, um, as well as values of an organization. Thank you, Connie. Uh, next speaker is Tiu Li Lim. She oversees ASEAN business at Accenture and has its Singapore office. So, uh, Lei Lim, how does change today differ, differ from the past? How is it more disruptive? Okay, so maybe let me build on uh, what Arunda has said earlier. Um, I think we all accept and know that technology has constantly changed. So what's different now? I heard the earlier panel talk about Google Maps, and that's a very good example. Because what we see in this 4IR world is the fact that all of these technologies all of a sudden are exploding at an exponential rate, and therefore has what we call the combinatorial effects. So you have maps, but you also have mobiles at the, at, at the, uh, at, at the level of uh, sophistication today, so that the maps in our pocket will actually tell us where we are because of, uh, of the GPS. And then, where do you store all the data? Well, it's in the cloud. So the combination of all of these technologies exploding and progressing at the rate that they have creates this tremendous effect, which has enabled change. I think the second thing that's different about for the fourth industrial revolution is that it is not contained in our offices and our shop floors. Uh, it, has found its way into our homes. It's, um, it's the stuff uh, that the kids play with, the toys and the refrigerators that come alive. And we call those living products more than smart products because it literally has a life of its own that will continue to refresh and update through its product life cycle. So it's everywhere. Um, it's powerful. It combines the effects of different technologies and as a result of which, it forces disruption and change. One of which is in business models. So because of IoT, um, Philips in some markets would sell not a light bulb, but it sells lighting. Some of the industrial engines, uh, engine manufacturers would sell power by the hour, not so much the assembled product. It's changed the way we have traveled with the Ubers, and the grabs of this world. And therefore, it is a sustainable change which is pervasive and it's everywhere. And I think the fourth outcome of this is that it has redefined industry. So if we were always very comfortable uh, operating within the boundaries of one industry, well, I think there are enough examples to show that those industry barriers are coming down or at least are blurring and new players will come in and potentially be more successful than the incumbents. And so I think that's, to me, is, um, is the, 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 the rate of disruption and it's what's different this time round. Thank you, Lilium. And uh, the last and best, but certainly not least, Chris, Chris Kimo. As you, may, as you shifted your job from Microsoft to EF, the uh, <laughs> education first, you know both the tech world and education industry so how AI-based and data-driven technology can be used to improve access to better education and facilitate the free flow of knowledge? Sure. Um, let me first take a step back and talk about the job market, really, and how the job market has changed over the years. You know, um, my parents and their generation, it was you would learn one skill, and ideally you'd work for one company for your whole career. My mother worked for 34 years for the same company. 
And then in my generation, it's like, well, maybe you, you learn one or two skills or you have one or two careers and maybe you work for a couple of companies. But when you start looking at Gen Z, at millennials and Gen Z, um, you, we call them the slash generation. It's, uh, it's, they are not just one thing, they are multi-characteristic. For example, you could be a nurse slash DJ slash yoga instructor. And each one of those jobs and hobbies actually earn you money. Maybe your main job is being a nurse, but you're making money as a DJ and you're making money um, also as a yoga instructor. So it's really this diversification of opportunity. And then when you look further at the, the generation that has yet to be named, I mean, what do we call people who come after Gen Z? They're amongst us now. Some of us have kids who are, who are younger than Gen Z. But fully, uh, the, for the, the kids who just started primary and elementary school this past month, uh, by the time they finish with university, 65% um, of them will work in jobs that haven't been invented yet. So how, how are we planning for them or how do they make the decision what they're going to be? Um, whether you're in the, no, the uh, yet to be named generation or you're a millennial, Gen Z, Gen X or part of the, the greatest generation, I think really the opportunity here is about this concept of lifelong learning, which is said a lot. And, and while I'll talk a little bit later about AI, I think the change is already happening that you can see that while, while universities and apprenticeships are still strong and how do we train workers for their skills, but there's a huge amount of technology out there through websites, through local programs and cities that provide lifelong learning opportunities for anybody who's interested. And so I think as we think about the future of work and we think about individuals, I think I really, I'll, I'll talk about two main challenges. One is on the job seeker side. It is in this world where technology is disrupting businesses and disrupting which jobs are available and what you can do. It's really you have to have this, uh, you hear about the growth mindset, right? It's the fact that I say not, oh, I'm not a programmer, it's I'm not a programmer yet. And so that nurse that we talked about earlier, they may uh, go in their DJ hobby turns into, oh, they're so interested, they go from DJing into music production. And for music production, they use a lot of computers these days in music production. And so that may lead to an interest in programming. And there's a lot of great programs out there to learn how to become a programmer. And so it's really, you have to have that desire of lifelong learning and the growth mindset that you can learn anything and do anything that you're passionate about and you're gonna spend the time, at, time in, in learning. Now that's tied from, from the job seekers. The second challenge I have is actually with the hiring managers. Uh, today, when you look at a lot of job descriptions, especially in technology field, for entry level positions, at the bottom of the job description, it'll say bachelor's degree required in computer science or an equivalent field. And the reason that's there for us hiring managers is because in a typical interview, you may only spend about five to six, maybe seven hours with you and your team talking to an individual, and you have to make a judgment on whether or not they're right to work for you and your team for years to come. And so we put in that bachelor's degree required as a sense of trust. I'm only gonna be, be able to ask this person so many questions, so uh, by having that bachelor's degree there as a backstop for trust, I assume they know a lot of other things. But I've, I'm that nurse who's gone and learned programming uh, by myself through a community program or through an online program. I'm not gonna go back and do, have that four-year certificate. So really, we'll have to look as hiring managers as in this world of a gig economy, of a slash career model, how am I as a hiring manager gonna build trust on somebody who has taken advantage of lifelong learning and has done something that doesn't require a four-year degree? Now, luckily, there is technology that's coming along to help solve that as well. I just, just yesterday, LinkedIn announced these skills assessments, and you can go in, they have about somewhere between 10 to 20 different skills tests you can take on LinkedIn, and it take about 15 minutes. Uh, most of them are programming, but they also have one for Excel and PowerPoint. I took the PowerPoint test yesterday, uh, and, and, and I failed, uh, which is interesting. But um, they have, they're trying to build this kind of trust infrastructure so that if you meet their criteria for the skill, you can put it in your LinkedIn profile, and then hiring managers can look at that and determine do they trust LinkedIn skills assessment. And so we're starting to see how technology can, uh, in some ways, disrupt the traditional education model, which is K through 12 or apprenticeships or universities. And you start to see these other models popping up that are not just about learning skills, but it's also building this trust model between the, the skill learners and job seekers and those hiring managers. Thank you, great. Uh, we'll come back to some of the points you've made and el elaborate.
but let me focus on the business from now. Do you think business, businesses are fully aware of the importance of digital transformation and innovation? If so, how are they managing it? Leilin? You know, I, I think um, businesses are fully aware. Um, I think the challenge is where do I start and how do I think of what my priorities need to be. And so, you know, our point of view is, um, and, and you hear things like, okay, you know, you have your traditional business and don't continue to invest there because it's going away and build a new. Well, there's a dilemma because it's your current business, if you are successful in that market, that pays for the light bills and pays the real estate. So our point is what we call the wise pivot, which we advocate you have to do three things at the same time to deal with disruption. You need to transform the core. And that's a little bit like what Arunda said. You can automate, you can uh, become more efficient and be more productive, and that's transforming the core. You could find new ways to engage customers like the car companies do in terms of AR to help visualize your interior and what the drive experience is. So you can transform the core, but you also need to grow the core because with that, you create the investment capacity to scale the new. And, uh, and so that's a little bit also been our own story in terms of how we've had to uh, evolve our own traditional businesses where we run, we run operations, we've automated extensively, taking out about 30% of our workforce, even though they may be in lower cost countries or whether, whether it be the way we do technology, which was very large scale uh, tech projects on proven solutions to get into the digital space, which is very different. Uh, it's very short sprints and with unproven technologies. So it's, it's all about, uh, in our view, the core is still important, uh, but the new is equally important and you probably need to do all three at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Connie, do you want to add some comments? Um, yeah, so I think the core is exactly right. Um, so, you know, in our business, we're, we run a people business, right? We don't have machines, but we do have machines as in they supplement what the people do. And for us, building the core is not simply about investing in technology. We want to invest in people as well. So, you know, the reskilling and the upskilling um, as it is really important. What we want to do is actually to build a culture where people are not afraid of change and they're embracing change so that when technology comes, the question is not, is it going to take away my job? But how can I do the job better? And how can I work alongside the technology? So I think investing in people is important. But that, of course, brings about another question. You know, how much does the employer invest? Because that is, you know, we're all running a business. There's a cost to the business, right? How does the accountants, how do the accountants look at this cost recorded on the, on the, on the P&L? Um, is it an investment or is it a cost, a training cost? Um, and what are the governments doing? Um, so, you know, in, in Davos in January this year, I felt really proud to be Singaporean because the Skills Future program in Singapore was discussed many times and Singapore was kind of the golden child because apart from getting in employers to invest in people, the, the government, the public sector is also doing its part by crediting um, people's accounts with, um, I think it's $500. So my, my 70 year old mother has $500 in her account and she's used it to upskill herself to learn English. Well, not that she's going to get a job, but it's allowed people, I'm talking about, you know, fairly extreme. Um, and everyone 25 year old, years old and up has a credit. And that's just the start of how the public sector is going to invest. So I think it's a three hands to clap. Um, the, employer, the employee needs to want to change. The employer needs to invest. And I think the public sector needs to do something as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, uh, Aruna? Uh, everybody can jump in during the discussion. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just add one point to it, which is I think organizations need to proactively explain some of this to employees because sometimes there's so much fear, uncertainty, and confusion around, hey, what's going to happen to my job if automation comes and so on. So while we all know that reskilling needs to be done, there is, I think, something around communication and securing that with our employees before they uh, get into some kind of uh, panic mode. So managing that change is very important. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe a comment, you know, based on what Chris said and what Connie has just said is that um, what we've done in the last 12 to 18 months has been on a journey to deal with this uh, transformation of a mindset 
from qualifications to skills and in support of clearly things like skills future together with the government initiatives mm -hmm. and uh, what we found is yes the interview process sometimes gets in the way um, and so we've applied technology to try and solve for that with our new entry ha new entry levels so putting them through a tool we call Pymetrics and of course many other choices out there so that at the first level there's no bias from that human interaction and it's not based upon a qualification it's based upon a set of skills on which we then as the company can build on and clearly the, the, the interactions come later in terms of traditional interview processes but I think that's allowed us to, to navigate away from necessarily only hiring from universities. Uh, for, for some of our tech and digital jobs, we are completely open to hiring people with, who come from different uh, pathways and so So that's a little bit about you know, what we are trying to do and learn from and, and maybe uh, you know, uh, advocate for in, in the industry. If, if I could just go back to something that Chris mentioned, which is what, what, what did you say about 60% of the jobs are not yet invented? 65% of the jobs that kids entering elementary school today and will graduate to or have not been invented. Exactly. So the question is, what are we training and you know planning for the future? I think I think we need to recognize that to do that in detail is impossible. So so basically, what we can do is to create a learning culture and to create the environment and the ability to do that because we don't know what we don't know. Okay. Just and and that to me is uh, extremely important. You know, somebody was telling me that earlier knowledge was even today. Okay, knowledge is power. And the person who had the knowledge had the you know, ability to influence and get a position of power. But today, when knowledge is so freely available, the information is available, what you need to know is not the information, but know how to find the information, which is a fundamental uh, difference. So mm -hmm. what we can really train and skill people is on really leveraging what is available and then learning a new skill. I think just to add to Aruna's point, um, you know, where knowledge is um, so freely available, I mean, the internet and di everything digital is borderless. Um, and Chris, you mentioned about, you know, you put a line in there that says Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering or something along those lines. Um, I mean, it throws up a good question. Are the universities and tertiary education preparing um, the, the, the future generation for the workforce? Because I was um, preparing for this panel, I was reading some reports, and there are some jobs like in 20 years' time that we haven't even dreamt about. Like, so for example, they predicted something like um, cyber, cyberspace identity protector, flying car designer, um, you know, um, cyber security a calamity predictor, things like that, which may come. Uh, and are, are we as employers and are the educators um, setting up our future generation for this, these types of jobs? Yeah, I think. Go, I was going to say, not, not just the future generation, but even the current generations, right? All of us have to have to also embrace that lifelong learning as well. Yeah, I think we will come to the individual part. Uh, uh, Chris, what do you think of the lifelong uh, learning? How how could how could uh, lifelong learning prevent workers and the young generation from being left behind in this economy? Well, let, let me talk a little bit about um, we talk about some technology and AI disrupting, and I'll go back to it. You know, technology disrupting things is not new. AI is, machine learning is just the current flavor. Uh, my first, I liked when I introduce myself to people, I often ask what my first, what's your first job? And so my first job was a paper boy when I was 12 years old where I would deliver newspapers to residences to about 42 every single day of the week for a year. And um, that job's pretty obsolete now, right? But the technology of the internet and smartphones and apps, they deliver to news to us all the time. So why would you need a physical piece of, uh, uh, paper delivered to your door. Um, my second job was when I was 16, I worked in a cafe making cappuccinos and espressos uh, long before Starbucks was a thing. And um, while Starbucks is still a thing today, a lot of you in the audience and maybe some people on the panel actually have robots in their house like Nespresso machines that will make that cappuccino for you. It'll grind the beans, it'll, it'll make the espresso, it'll add the hot milk and maybe in a fancy model will add the foam on top of it. I mean that's technology in our house. Dishwashers 
are robots, actually. They're replacing repetitive human behavior. And really, that's what AI machine learning is today. It is an efficient way to replace repetitive human behavior, whether it's in factories, um, it's in workflow processes, it's coming to the legal fields in some parts. But the thing that humans are always have a leg up on AI is that AI generally, for the most part today, it focuses on very specific tasks. AI can do a task very well, it can optimize the task, it can sometimes come up with creative solutions to the task, but it's very task specific. And we as humans are built as general purpose quote, machines at the end of the day. And so, so the advantages that we have and the things that we can think about how we train ourselves and our future generations is to focus on areas of, of skills like technology, of skills like creativity, and skills of communication. And um, those are things that AI is hard pressed to, to, to beat humans at for the foreseeable future. And sure, you can say, okay, Chris, actually, actually I use this myself. In my pocket, on my iPhone, I have Google Translate, and I've been living in Shanghai now for about 14 months, and unfortunately, while I'm fluent in German, my Chinese is terrible, and I'm trying to make baby steps every single day or every week, but I often use Google Translate, and so you say, Chris, why do you need to learn to communicate if I have Google Translate in my pocket? Well, this is a great example. Google Translate is based on some smart technology, smart translation, and automatic speech recognition, blah, 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 blah. But um, I often find when I talk with, with Chinese people through Google Translate, I'm missing something. Because Google Translate doesn't take into account cultural differences. It may do a little translation of words, but it doesn't, doesn't take into fact cultural differences, or it doesn't read emotions between what I'm saying and what the person I'm talking to is saying. And so we as humans have this opportunity to learn languages, to immerse ourselves in culture, and be able to find the subtle details and differences in communicating with somebody, which is important with relationships, with negotiations, with working in an office space. So um, I think that whilst AI and machine learning is disrupting a lot of jobs, if we focus on things like lifelong learning, if we focus on skills like technology and creativity and communication, that we as humans will continue to be prepared to find the next great opportunity uh, and the next great uh, job opportunity or business model that's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how should the employers invest in reskilling and upskilling at their workforces? Um, Maybe I, maybe, maybe I could try. Um, we have a workforce of probably about 500,000 people today working in an industry which is being disrupted every day. Uh, and so we've actually applied technology to help us uh, get the humans to, uh, to, to join us on the journey. Uh, so through a mixture, I, I think the first thing as we talk about jobs is a job is made up of different roles which require different specializations. And uh, each specialization is made up of different skills. And so I think when I think about these as the bricks that make up a person, I think that gives our folks the confidence that I have skills that I have to combine in different ways to be a specialist in some thing. And that thing may change, but I have two bricks that I can use, and I need to learn a third brick to be recombined, to be relevant for the future. And so I think that's been sort of, at least the way we've chosen to deal with it is uh, using AI to look at every single person in the firm, uh, using algorithms that would almost calibrate the level of specialization and proficiency. Uh, but more importantly than that, is also then to use AI, an AI tool so that every individual can go in and say, based on my job description, how much of that could actually become redundant? And when you do that, it creates the pull because very often the supply side is not the problem. The availability of training, there's an abundance out there. But for people to own it and to take actions to stay relevant, you know, that's something that's harder. And so that's at least been, been our way of trying to uh, make sure that people are incentivized and motivated to stay relevant and to go and take that uh, extra training you know, that they may need to. So that's just one, one example, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Maybe just, just to add to that, um, you know, the, 
for, for us, it's about um, a lot about um, soft skills training. So, um, you know, the, you know, Chris has touched on, you know, communication skills, presentation skills, cr uh, critical thinking, innovation, um, being able better to connect with clients. Because, um, you know, law firm is ultimately a people business and we deal with people on the other side. Um, so, you know, the learning is not um, simply by classroom teaching or online teaching of technical skills. That's almost like a given of what we already do. Um, there's a lot of experience-based learning because we have found that the slash or generation uh, Z or Y that join us, for, for them it's a lot about like, an experience. They want to have an experience with the organization they join. And to give them the experience, it involves aligning their values, um, the values they have and our values, and also um, getting them to have to learn through experience. So when I say learn through experience, I don't mean just client work, but doing, say, CSR work, pro bono work. Um, and in some, er some places in our network, you know, we operate in 30-something uh, 30, 30 offices in 26 countries. In some of these offices, we have secondments to NGOs, the idea being that by working in an NGO, you, you learn to connect with people from different strata of society, um, and you're able to yet exercise some of your legal skills. So people get, you know, some of our trainees, they do a secondment to a, um, an NGO to provide legal service. Um, and through that kind of experience-based learning, um, we hope that when they come back, they actually provide a better service to a client, but also then creates stickiness for us to retain our talent. But how can government to uh, how can government provide uh, 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 protects for less protected uh, workers? Um, I think I think sort of I think that the, the more important question is how can the government actually provide the support that's needed um, for employers to structure um, someone's um, I guess uh, career trajectory as well as the personal needs. So let's just um, maybe zoom in on the um, demographic of sort of women, working women um, in society. What is the protection, you know, our sort of maternity leave, maternity leave um, benefits? Um, that's kind of pretty uh, ingrained and entrenched in regulation. But, you know, the support that's needed for a woman coming back from maternity leave, that's critical. So, you know, I have, I've had a lot of colleagues worry about whether their jobs, they would still be in the, in the track to partnership if they could have a child, they go on maternity leave. And when they come back, how do they tell clients they're back? And what if they're worried that clients will be um, suspicious or worry about their commitment and indeed their bosses? So, you know, these are the things where uh, employers could do more to, to protect and to support uh, working women um, and the government um, should also be looking at ways to subsidize and actually provide some uh, incentives for employers to do that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to cut back to the business side of the thing real quick because uh, we're our clock's ticking down up here in front of us. So uh, on the business side, one practical thing that we discussed earlier as we were talking before we came on stage, uh, something that employers and actually hiring managers can do and, and um, to encourage especially women to, I know this is a technology focused opportunity for hiring managers. When I was at Microsoft, we were very focused on trying to get more women into the technological roles at Microsoft and, and Microsoft did a survey and saw that uh, women were reading job descriptions differently than men were and it was actually causing a challenge of finding a, a lot of talented women um, candidates were not applying and it the, the the summary boils down to this in a typical technology job description you can often have a lot of bullets of information about what the job requires a list of what this is what your job is about uh, here are required skills here are nice to have skills and you can get somewhere between 10 and 20 different bullets uh, in a gross generalization, men will see that and they'll say like, well, I qualify about 50 or 60 or maybe 75% of those all apply for the job. And a woman would look at that list and say, there's one thing that I'm not qualified for, so I'm not going to apply for the job. And it was really hurting us because we were basically looking at the funnel of talent and we were dropping it down significantly because of the way that our potential uh, employees were reading these job descriptions. So one of the things we started doing is take the most important three or four or five bullets 
and put that in a job description. Keep those other things that you have, those other five or 10 bullets, keep them in your head. And during the interview process, you can ask those bullet questions on the fly, but don't overburden the job description because you want to get the most possible people to apply as possible. Uh, Aruna, uh, uh, what's your opinion on unlocking the economic potential of women and ensuring gender balance in uh, traditionally male dominant industries like, in, like uh, technology? Yeah. So in technology actually is the easiest industry for women in my view because it is, it is purely based on merit. It's not like hard labor based sometimes like in manufacturing. So I, I, I think the issue there is that the intake of STEM graduates is quite low. So it's only 30% from, I, I don't know, I think that's a global average. Only 30% uh, of uh, the STEM students are, which is science technology um, students are uh, women. Therefore, there's a natural already bias at the uh, entry level. So we have to uh, make sure that we do uh, different things on getting them all in. We have to get the full 33% in and then make sure that they don't drop out because at the leadership level, I know in the tech industry, it just drops down to eight or 9%. And it's, it's um, I don't have to give you the statistics, but you know, it is proven that having more women is, uh, is very beneficial to organizations. And especially in the tech industry, we, we are so short of people. We are so short of people that how can we even afford to miss a single person who is able uh, and uh, capable of doing the work but the biggest issue we need to address there is people coming back for a second career so a lot of people who drop out very competent women are because they take uh, a break for childbearing or uh, things like that and then it is an organization's responsibility to make sure that we do everything to attract them back reskill them upskill them because in one year they can become outdated the fundamental skills don't change change but the, but you know the, the technology is changing so fast that as an organizations we all have to take a commitment that we will invest in reskilling them and bring them back into the workforce okay great uh, I know we have more to dis discuss but time is so limited uh, we have to come to the final part last question what has prepared you to become you today to embrace the changes I want you to share your future-proof secret with our audience today. From Chris. Okay, I'm first. Um, so um, I think you know it's interesting. I I was um, I've been at EF Education First for a little over a year now in Shanghai, and it really. Um, yeah, it started, it's my EF changed my life. I actually was an exchange student through EF back in high school where I left the United States and went to Germany for a year. And uh, because of that experience, when I was in the American military, I asked to be stationed in Germany. And because I was stationed there, I met my wife. And because I met my wife, we raised our daughters uh, speaking German and traveling to Europe a lot. And when later on with this opportunity to EF, uh, to work for EF in China came up, um, I, I relish the idea. So for me, my future-proof secret is about, it's not just lifelong learning of skills, it's about lifelong learning about life. Like how do you put yourself out there and take advantage of all that life has and, um, and knowing that it'll work itself out. Like I failed in lots of things in my life and that's part of, of living life to the fullest. Um, but that's constantly me, constantly seeking to live life to the fullest and seek out opportunities has set up me for success in, um, in my relationship with my wife, uh, in my relationship as a father with my daughters, um, and in the workforce as well. Okay, so um, actually it's somewhat similar, but uh, let me personalize it. I, when I was, uh, in, in my youth, I was a competitive tennis player. And, uh, and my dad was always there by the courts watching me play and uh, he believed that uh, the skills will be equalized but really in the end what makes a winner or a loser is in the mind. So, uh, so I had the benefit of this piece of advice which I have always uh, referred to which is that he said that uh, you must want to win but you cannot be afraid to lose. And that was actually quite uh, helpful for me through my life because it means that you've got to put yourself out there You've got to have the courage to take the opportunities if they are in front of you and not think twice about, oh, maybe I won't uh, succeed, but just go ahead and do it. And actually, just to, to talk about the future of work, I think the tremendous opportunity for women, if you think about it, it's STEM. Yes, we always index on STEM, 
But if you look at the co-founders of companies like PayPal, LinkedIn, Airbnb, something that comes up is that some of these guys were liberal arts majors, which means that in the world of human plus machine, actually understanding the humans is incredibly important. And so, uh, so I look forward, I think, to the future of work whereby it doesn't matter where you start, I was a business graduate, I was not a STEM graduate. Uh, and so I think, you know, look at the possibilities, put yourself out there and, um, and engage. I think that's, uh, that would be my, uh, my thing. Thank you, Khan. So um, it's interesting, Lee Lim says she's a competitive tennis player. I tried to play competitive tennis, but my father didn't give me the same advice, so I probably didn't get to the same level as Lee <laughs> um, But for me, I think it's um, maybe to put it very generally, being brave. Um, there's uh, always a little voice at the back of my head, and I think it resonates in a lot of women sitting here, is, you know, should I do it? Am I good enough? That's always that question. Am I good enough for this? And are there people better than me? Am I qualified to do it? But somehow, mentally, I overcame that and said, OK, let's just try it and not be afraid to lose. Um, and the, the other point, I guess, is, um, you know, reskilling and retooling, right? So, you know, uh, being brave, but also understanding that you may not be fully qualified for the job, but, you know, be confident that you can actually pick up some of these skills along the way, because I guess technical skills are almost a given, but a lot of it, as uh, you know, the other esteemed panelists have alluded to, are your soft skills of how you interact with people. And last but not least, and, and this is really a message to everyone out here, um, look for your champions within your organization and be a champion yourself, because the people you're dealing with, the women you're dealing with, will often have these doubts and questions in their head. But because you understand them, you need to encourage them to take the next step, to believe in them. So far, my champions have mainly been men, I have to say. But I, I hope that will change, where women can be champions of other women. And I think that will have more diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Keep it short. I believe in daring to dream and daring to live the dream by taking bold steps and not having any bias in the thinking. Thank you. Uh, be confident, uh, take the opportunity when it comes. Uh, uh, women can do better in the future of work. Okay, that is the end of the session. Thank you so much for all the panelists. Uh, thank you all for, the, for your attention. Thank you, see you next time.